jump into the Word, and we're going to look at a number of important passages and scriptures this morning. So we're in uh, Philippians chapter 2, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. And Lee did a great job last week, didn't he? He did a great job. That boy was on fire. <laughs> and so hopefully you will remember the imagery in particular of what Christ did for us, stepping down and then God exalting him. This week's passage flows from that passage, that imagery, okay? It flows from that and built upon it. And so today we are going to get instruction from the Word of God, from the Apostle Paul, telling us how we are to follow Christ, showing us that we need to follow him in what he did to a degree of God's calling to us. And so we get some practical help, including do everything without <laughs> arguing or grumbling. But there's some important theology here that I pray that we understand. And so we're going to talk about that this morning, talking about how to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's an important uh, piece of information collected with God's working in us and through us. So I want us theologically to understand that, how it works, how we're to live as Christians as we follow Christ. So that is where we're going. Again, we are in Philippians chapter 2. The first point, and there's three points today, and I'll spend excuse me, the most amount of time on the first point is to continue to work out your salvation. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to unpack it, but it's an important um, command in Scripture. Excuse me. So here we are, Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 12. We're going to do 12 and 13, and we're going to unpack that for a moment or two. It starts this way. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Okay, we're going to stop right there. That paragraph, those couple sentences, have some significant theology in it. The first thing that I want us to be aware of is that little word right there in the beginning. Therefore. Okay, when you see the word therefore, you know what I'm going to say. You have to ask, why is it therefore, okay? What is the point of this word? Now, Paul puts it there, saying, built upon, just because of everything that I just communicated to you, therefore this, because of what Christ has done, because Christ humbled himself, because, therefore, you'll see that in verse 9, let me look back, because God exalted him now, in light of Christ and his work, in light of being united in mind, in light of doing, being connected to one another, I want you now to do this thing. This is what's here, that we would have the same mindset of Jesus Christ. We are, and this is verse 3 and 4, right? We are to do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. And I don't know about you, I've been thinking about this all this last week, examining my own motives, why I do what I do. Am I doing this because I am selfish? Am I doing this because I'm proud, vain conceit? What is happening? And we are told to have the mindset of Christ Jesus. And it says, now, don't do that, but rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So we're asked, we're not just asked, we're told, we're commanded to have that way of thinking or that mindset. 
That's a lot in and of itself, by the way, right? And then Paul then shows us through the life of Christ how that mindset worked in Jesus. That's what that hymn of praise and Philippians chapter 2 is all about, right? Didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to, right? And became obedient, became on, took on the very nature of a servant, empty himself out, right? Even to death, death on the cross. It's the downward ascension. How do you like that? Down word in humility, in obedience to the Father, in having a mindset putting others above himself. God help us to think that way. Right? Hear me, think first, because our actions, by the way, flow out of our thoughts. This is why we are told to renew our mind and to think about such thing. This is the turning of our mind. This is where the Word of God helps us to do this. Think this way. Christ thought that way. Christ was obedient. So therefore, we are to be obedient as well. Do you understand how this is connected, okay? This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. He says, therefore, be obedient, not just when I'm with you, but always, okay? And so this helps us to recognize that often it is easiest to live our Christianity in the presence of other Christians. Why? Because they keep us accountable, right? Why often? Because we care about their opinion. Paul is saying, hey, listen, your obedience, and by the way, the obedience was not to Paul in this passage. The obedience was to the Word of God, just like we saw Jesus obedient to the Word of God. He says, hey, as always, be, be obedient to God, regardless if I'm with you or not with you. It's important that we honor and submit ourselves and follow God's word. So this is what Paul is saying here. He says, listen, it is important for you to be obedient to the word. Now, do you like the word obedient? It should be kind of mixed, right? right? I like that word for my kids, right? <laughs> do what I tell you to do, right? Or if you're an employer, or whatever, if you own pets, right, you want them to be obedient. We love it on that side. Often, we struggle when we're on the other side of that, that we are the ones to be obedient. Now, every Sunday, you'll see on our screen our mission statement. You've probably seen it so much that you don't see it anymore. Right? Like the picture in the hallway, you know that's there, but you don't remember what's on it because you've seen it so much, right? Our mission statement is intentional. It is actually based on Romans chapter, thank you for putting it up there, Romans chapter 1, verse 5. It's straight from Scripture. We just added we exist, right? We've adopted it as our aim as a congregation. Now, if you notice, it says we exist to what? To bring about, what's the word there? The obedience of faith. Now, faith and obedience, believing, receiving, and conceiving or possessing, they go hand in hand. Look at this, a two-handed illustration with a microphone. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself right now. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> they go hand in hand, right? We believe, all right? So we obey. You understand that, right? It's an inward work with an outward expression. We believe in Christ, so we follow Christ, right? And so receiving and believing that who Christ is and what he's done and giving our life to him, we get an exchange of that grace for a new grace to live like him. 
And this is what Paul is talking about. That we, because we have faith in Christ, will be obedient to Christ. We will walk in the same way Christ walked. And just in the passage before it, we saw that example. Humbling himself, serving other people, becoming obedient in his living, but also in his dying, right? This, my friends, is what we're called to as Christians, to be like Christ, to be obedient of faith. Now, the good news is, and I'm going to get to it in just a second, that God's Spirit is the thing that works in us, right? To give us the desire and the power to do His will. It's more grace upon grace. He gives us grace and salvation, right? That we don't work for our salvation. We work because we're saved, right? It's so not work for your salvation, but work your salvation out. Live it. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm excited about this, right? God helps us in this, giving us both the will and the power to act. I want you to know that in your flesh, your sinful nature, I'm not talking about your physical body, I'm talking about your sinful nature, it doesn't want to obey God, right? We have an inner two-year-old that is defiant, You have it. I have it. That's why we have to be born again. That's why we have to, quote unquote, crucify our flesh. That's why we have to choose to walk according to the Spirit. There is an inward battle. And so I can't tell you, hey, you just must do Christianity better. I can't. What I can tell you to do is surrender to Christ. Believe in him and ask God, check this out, God, give me the desire to do your will. Do you always have the desire to do God's will? Don't lie. I don't. Right? Sometimes I want to grumble. Right? Sometimes I want to be angry. Sometimes I want just to be lazy. Right? But I know that God's spirit, I said, God, will you give me the desire and the power to do your will? That is really good news. Right? I love Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. I love the whole chapter. Okay, I love the whole book, right? <laughs> but I memorized it because it helps me, right? It's the prayer that God will always answer. When you pray, God, will you give me the desire and the power to do what pleases you? God, will you do that? God will answer that prayer every single time. Why? Because it's his will. How do you know that, Dave? Because he said it. Right? That's the power of scripture memorization. Okay. So Paul is saying, hey, therefore, what we know about Christ... Now, be obedient to the scriptures. Be obedient to these things, knowing that God is the one ultimately who works in you and will help you act. So continue to work out your salvation with fear and Trembling. I'm going a little bit out of order from my notes. It makes sense there, but this is how it's coming out today. Maybe because I'm a one-handed preacher. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to go left hand. Continue to work out your salvation. Do you remember when Jesus taught in John chapter 15 about the vine and the branches? Remember that illustration? John 15, you can read it again. Okay. The illustration is this, that... We, he is the vine, we are the branches, and if we abide 
in him, we will produce the fruit of his working in us. Okay? This is abiding in Christ. Now, we have a responsibility to be in Christ. How does that happen? By belief. I believe in Jesus Christ, and I am connected to him through faith by grace. I receive his forgiveness, and, uh, and he takes, he gives me forgiveness and gives me new life. And we need to be connected to him. Practically how this works out, belief in your heart, fanning the flame, renewing your mind, talking to him, him in prayer, and being connected through his word, and being pu pushing out the fruit of the Spirit. Now, when I say pushing out the fruit of the Spirit, how does that work? Well, you all have trees, right? You know how trees work, right? Trees. Trees are, have roots, and they have fruit, okay? That's like an apple tree. We'll just take that for example, right? The trunk, the roots have a responsibility, so do the branches or the vines. You and I have a responsibility as we are connected to Christ to do the work that God is working inside of us. We have to st stretch out our we have to stretch out our mm, spiritual muscles. We have to grow so that God can work in us, but we have a part to do. This is our obedience to God's working within us. This is our walking as Christ would have us to walk. Now, there's a lot of scriptures here. I'm going to bring a couple to our mind that connects with this. Remember in John chapter 3, if you're with us in the John series, and we love John chapter 3 because it's 316 is in there, which we love and memorize. It encapsulates the gospel. And so... My, uh, my Siri thinks I said her name, so he's, he's like, hey, talk to me. <laughs> and I turned you off. Okay. I believe in Jesus, Siri. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> John 3, 36. This is the verse here. It should be up on the screen. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. This is salvation or justification built upon what Christ has done in the past. Justification, by the way, is a theological term that means that we are legally right with God. Our sin is forgiven. Whoever believes in the Son, past tense, with a um, present tense application, has eternal life, which future tense will be culminated or will have for eternity. Now, whoever does not, here's the word, <clears throat> obey. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. Whoa. But the wrath of God remains on him. And by the way, the wrath of God is on everyone because of our sin. The only shelter is Christ who took the wrath in our place so that we may be go, we go free. And so there's a connection here. And this is Jesus himself saying, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey, which means that if we believe, then we will obey. Because you cannot obey without believing, okay? And you are not believing if you do not obey. He connects this here, right? Here's another verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting with verse 7. The Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, okay, this will happen. Afflicting vengeance, whoa, on those who do not know God, okay, believe, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. From the notes here, there, there is and must be a believing and a conceiving. A reception and a production, a root and a fruit. One cannot and will not have one without the other. They are linked together. This is how we are to continue to work out our salvation with fear 
and trembling, right? I stated it before. I'm going to say it again. It is vital for you to understand that you're not working for your salvation, but working out your salvation. Our salvation is based on what Jesus has done for us. That's Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Okay, this is where our salvation is based. And it's evidenced by our partnership and what Jesus is doing through us. Okay, it's done and it's doing. This is what is happening here. There's another verse that I love, and you've heard it up here many times. This is Ephesians chapter 2. For it is grace you have been saved, right, through faith. And we can say amen, right? It's not your own doing, right? It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. No one's going to wash up on the shores of heaven saying, let me in because I'm awesome. It's not going to happen. Salvation is by grace, through faith, right? Get this. It's not your own doing. You cannot earn it. Christ did that on our behalf. That's the first part. And coupled with that is now, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to just believe and sit around until Jesus comes back, right? Is that what it says? We are created in Christ Jesus for what? To do these good things, His will, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is a passage that you should memorize. Helpful, right? This is the illustration which I just talked about, about abiding the vine and the branches. And it's important to know that it's God who works in you to will and to act according in order to fulfill his good purpose. This helps us a lot. The Christian life is grace from beginning to end. Some graces, this is important, I'm reading this, some graces are received instead of our effort. That's what Christ has done. We cannot earn salvation. This is the grace we received and some graces we receive as our effort and action. So instead of and as. This is sanctification. Justification is what Christ has done. We're legally right in front of God. Sanctification is this working out. This is the working out of our salvation until finally we are glorified. That's glorification when the sin Flesh is removed, and we are living and receiving in the light of God for all eternity. This is what Paul is talking about here. So it's important for us to obey, knowing that God is working in us. And this salvation is continuing to be worked out in us. Now, you'll notice in various places in Paul's letters, that he writes things like this. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 10. It says, I worked harder than any of them. Who is working here, by the way? Who's the I? It's not a trick question. It's Paul. <laughs> like, um, I don't know. Jesus? Okay, no, it's Paul. Okay. I worked harder than any of them. That is, comparing himself to the other apostles. He wasn't bragging. He was just telling the truth. Hey, I've worked really, really hard. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. He recognized that he was doing the work as God's grace was empowering him, giving him the desire and the power to do it. Here's another place, Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. For this I toil. Okay, that was bringing the gospel to this group in Colossae. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he, which is Christ, powerfully works within me. So this is a joining together of God's power, giving us the desire, giving us the strength to do his will. We believe, we receive salvation, and now we are working out this salvation with 
fear and trembling. Do you like that fear and trembling word? I don't. Well, what's that about, Paul? Isn't God loving? Absolutely true. Is God just? Absolutely true. We just have these images of, of Christ when he comes again. And when he comes again, it's going to be glory. No one's going to wonder, or no one's going to say, well, he already came back. Everyone's going to know, right? He comes back in his glory, in his power, to save those who believe in him, and it's the day of the vengeance upon sin. And so we know that we're in Christ and we work it out in light of God's glory and His goodness and His love and His justice. Well, how do you know, right? Have you ever asked that? Am I really saved? Here's the good news. I've had people ask me that a lot. Or people ask me, I have committed the impartable sin. The impartable sin, by the way, is rejecting Christ. That's the only thing that will exclude you from being in God's presence forever. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God? Has you asked him for the forgiveness of your sin? Have you placed your trust in him for your salvation? If you can say yes to that, we'll say amen. Now, how do I know that that's true? Well, because I just said it, okay? How do we know that the Spirit's working in us? He gives us a new mind. He gives us a new heart. Excuse me. We try to we we work to sanctify our mind, but he gives us a desire and a power to do this. We have that, and so our believing is evidenced by our living. That means we are looking to become more like Christ. Right now, are you perfectly like Christ? No, either am I. It is a process. It is a process of becoming like Christ. And so we say, God, help me. And if we stumble and fall, which you will stumble and fall at times, we repent, we get up, and we continue to move forward. Every time we do God's will, it's a miracle. Do you know that? It's a miracle that God causes, and it's a miracle that we have a partnership of acting out. So Paul instructed us this way, saying, hey, listen, listen, dear friends, obey, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, know that God who works in you, act in the will in order to fulfill his good purposes. Do you understand this? Do you understand it? What's that? Oh. If you have a convertible, you now have a swimming pool with wheels. <laughs> so if that's you, <laughs> thanks, Tom. He's waving me down. If you have your, your, um, your roof is open, then you have issues. So you might want to go out there. <laughs> it is raining, isn't it? Okay, I was talking about something. Okay. It's been quite a morning. <laughs> That's okay. Hopefully you understand this. I'm not going to continue to beat this, but understand that we have a responsibility because we're connected to Christ to live for Christ. I'll just leave it like that. Follow him. Walk the way that he walked. Okay, this is a good morning to test our roof. So if you see water coming down, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Second point is this. I've got to keep moving. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Okay? This is the passage starting with verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. This is an example. Why? So that you may become blameless and pure. Quote, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars and the sky, this is how you do it, as you hold firmly to the word of life. 
Okay, let's stop there. So as you heard multiple times, Scripture tells us, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Okay, that's a good one to memorize. I'm not kidding you. It's not hard, right? Do everything without grumbling or arguing, right? Underline everything. <laughs> not just the stuff you want to, but underline that. And then it talks about a couple things. Why are we going to do this? It's a contrast, okay? Contrast with the world, all right? Darkness to light. There's a couple contrasts here, but he tells us right at the end, do everything without grumbling or arguing as you hold firmly to the word of life. So the way in which we can live life not arguing or grumbling is to hold on to the word of God. Hold firmly. Did you catch that? What does that mean? That means that we memorize scriptures like this, that we fill our mind with God's word. So if you remember when you're ready to grumble, right? I can't believe I have to do this. Or I really, this is crazy. Or mm, you're asking me to do what? Right? And by the way, this is grumbling and arguing primarily, number one, according to this passage, against God. Second, against fellow believers. This is right here in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Thirdly, in the context of the world. So the primary application, by the way, is grumbling against God. Second, grumbling against those in the church. And again, thirdly, in the midst of the world. We do this by holding tightly to the Word of God. If you want to grow in not grumbling or complaining, the way to do that is to memorize Scripture. I'm just telling you. To think about Philippians chapter 2, to think about Christ. To think about various passages that we hold on to them. God, you're calling me to love my neighbor as myself. That will help you to not grumble and complain against them. When you think, God, my spouse forgot this again. You can remind them in love, but don't grumble against them or complain about it. This helps us. And so, by the way, in America, grumbling and complaining, we think it's one of our inalienable rights, right? We are free. We love freedom of speech, right? And we have made complaining an art form and a science. So we as Christians then, and this is the contrast that Paul is bringing out. In our world, it's crooked, right? Complaining, grumbling all the time. In contrast to those who are not in Christ, we are to do everything without crumbling. Crumbling. <laughs> That's true as well. <laughs> <laughs> crumbling or complaining, crumbling. Just put that in your mind. Don't crumble today, right? What would it be like if, in your workplace if you actually worked hard as unto the Lord? What would it be like in your home that you said, you know what, we're not going to grumble and complain here? That's a difference. Why does he say this? Because Jesus himself did not grumble and complain in his obedience. Now, I'm thinking that you're thinking, well, wait a second. Well, didn't he say, Father, let this cup pass from me? Do you remember that? Right. This was an expression of his will, but he said at the end of that, not my will, but yours be done. I'd rather not, but I will. He wasn't complaining nor grumbling. He's expressing himself. Why do we not do this? Because of Christ. How do we not do this? By holding on to his word. And if you choose to follow Christ in this way, your satisfaction and joy in life will exponentially increase. I'm not kidding you. Try it. 
well, I like to grumble, then you need to repent. I'm just saying. You say you're a Christian, oh, well, you're meddling now. Do you believe? Do you have any comfort, right? Any fellowship? Any benefit from being in Christ? Thank you, Philippians chapter 1. Then, right, being of like mind. Ant, do nothing out of grumbling or complaining. This is my challenge to us as a congregation. Some of you do this incredibly well. And your joy is typically very full, regardless of your external circumstances. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. That's how we become blameless and pure. That's how we stand out this way, shine among them as stars, as we again hold firmly to the word of life. It is a very helpful, practical thing that we can do. And let's work on that together. Scripture helps us to do that. Living and active is there in your notes. I'm going to continue on. The last thing is this. <clears throat> Rejoice in the joy to come. Now, there isn't always joy in the journey. Sometimes it's super difficult, right? You can obey, you can trust. But Paul says and helps us to rejoice in the joy to come. This is Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 16. And then I will be able to boast. So Paul is saying, hey, you guys are going to therefore work out your salvation. You guys are going to work on not grumbling or complaining because of God's working in you. And he says, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ. That is the day which he comes again. Okay? That I did not run, Paul is saying, as a minister or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering, he's giving his life on the sacrifice and service coming from their faith. Paul says, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you that I have the opportunity to do this so that you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now remember Christ, right? Remember that downward descent? And humility and obedience, remember that? Don't forget the next thing that was said. There's the therefore in verse 9. Therefore God exalted him right, to the highest place. Right? That every knee should bow and every tongue to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. God sees what you do and will reward you. It's not a sin, by the way, to look for God's reward. It is a motivational component of Christianity. Well, you can say, well, you know, isn't our reward salvation? And the answer to that is yes and. And I put a whole bunch of scriptures there. People who decide, I am giving myself in following Christ. I am giving myself in service to others. There is a reward granted that Christ is the one who gives us the desire and the power to do his will. But we have a responsibility to do that will. Every sacrifice that you make because of Christ matters. It matters to Christ and he sees it. Jesus chose to be obedient, and God exalted him. And your obedience trusts God for the outworking of the reward, right? It wasn't a glorious thing to be up on the cross. It was a glorious thing to be there. It was painful. It was hard. It was difficult. It wasn't a glorious thing for Paul to be chained to a prison wall. It wasn't glorious, but he says, I rejoice that the gospel is going forward. I rejoice in my salvation. And I rejoice that the work that I've done continues to go in your hearts. And when Christ comes again, I will rejoice in this. This is what Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 3. Excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm not going to read those verses. They're there for you. That there is an inheritance that is imperishable. There is an inheritance that is undefined and unfading, kept in heaven for you. This is good news to us. And so if you need some motivation to continue to move forward, 
God will help you in this. And so now we're going to do a quick interview with Michael. Here he comes. And Miles. Is Miles here somewhere? And can we use this microphone? No, we cannot. Michael knows things I don't know, which is not surprising. Okay. And so we asked these guys to share with us, and Miles is a young man who loves the Lord, how this has worked out in his life. So go for it. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. How you doing, Miles? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> you nervous? Yeah, good. definitely. <laughs> good. <laughs> It'll keep you focused. Ah. So I'm super excited to be here. So for those who haven't had a chance to meet Miles, um, maybe you've seen him. He's sometimes in the drum cage. Sometimes he's playing bass. Sometimes you don't see him. He's on cameras or helping on tech team. He's one of our youth leaders. Uh, really awesome, awesome guy. Loves the Lord, like Dave said. Um, I've had the opportunity, Miles, to know you for a little, uh, just over two years, right? Um, and you've actually been involved in Crosspoint and before that Mosaic for years. Hmm. Um, so... Can you just talk a little bit briefly about your faith, like how you came into the church, um, how, uh, how you've been involved in serving, things like that? Yeah, so when I was about five years old, I started attending Mosaic, and that was the church my parents chose. I didn't have <laughs> any, any freedom over that. Um, <laughs> I would go to Miss Gretchen's Sunday school, CKIA at the time, Christ Kids in Action. When I got a little bit older, I would go to uh, the youth group, on Wednesday nights. That's when I was first learning how to play drums, and I was a pretty terrible drummer at the time. Um, once the merge happened, I started playing for the, uh, the youth group upstairs. And uh, when it got a little bit better, one Sunday, Rob comes up to me and asks, hey, would you like to play, play drums next week? And uh, hesitantly, I said yes. I was really <laughs> horrified. I had to get over my fear of stage fright, but that was an important milestone. Uh, since then, I've been continuing to serve um, in Sunday morning by playing drums and filling in on bass. Uh, unfortunately, when the Burmese church had its split, uh, there was a lack of, of musicians, and I decided uh, I would uh, start playing bass for them. And ever since, I've been attending to every single uh, Burmese Sunday service. And I've been growing with them and fellowshipping with them. And just the connection I've been having with them is just fantastic. So, yeah. That's awesome, man. Thank you. And then, obviously, you've, been, you've hopped on other tech things as well. So thank you for your, your faithful serving. Thank you for saying yes to Rob to, to take on your stage fright and play drums in, the, in, in <laughs> Sunday service. Talk a little bit for me briefly um, and share with, with everyone. How did you come to faith in Jesus? So the simple answer is that... Uh, I was raised in a Christian household, so I was nurtured in my faith. Mm -hmm. But my testimony is, is much deeper than that. Um, when you grow, in a, grow up in a Christian household, you are confronted with this challenge of, of deciding whether you are naively following your parents and family mm -hmm. or if this God stuff is actually true. And, and my decision in faith is not based upon nothing. Um, it was about what God has done for me in the past. Now, if you know Chris and Jody, they're my mom and dad. They're sitting right back there. They're introverts, so I bet they love this shout out. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when I was first born, when I was uh, just a baby, I was living with my biological mom. Right? Chris and Jody are not my biological parents. Um, they call me my son. I call them mom and dad, but my birth certificate would say otherwise. And when I was first born and living in an apartment with my biological mom, I was neglected. My mom was a hard drug user. Uh, she had a lot of dangerous people over at the house, and I was put in a lot of dangerous situations. Um, and, and overall, it was just uh, neglect. Um, and it's a confusing and long story, but the fundamental part is when, when my mom and dad now, Chris and Jody, when they first met me when I was a baby, uh, the Holy Spirit told them both mutually that I would be their son. And a few months later, that's exactly what happened. Uh, my biological mom gave up custody, and my my parents now were, they have. <laughs> Sorry. I, coming okay? over coming over an illness, so I'm just coffee. Oh. No wait, no biggie. So, Sorry. Uh, my bio, or my mom and dad now have full custody of me, and they raised me ever since I was a baby, and I I don't have to go through that that dark lifestyle without God, um, and that is how I got to know Jesus and. You know, it, it was 
not really based off choices I made. Uh, God pulled me out of that, and that's how I got to know Jesus. It's, it's that's yeah. awesome, man. Praise so, so because of, of, of that, I, I have to give my life back to God because he saved me not only spiritually, but also my physical life here. Mm, amen. Praise the Lord, man. Um, so our passage today that, that David's been walking through talks about holding firmly to the word of life. Right, to Jesus, and, and to do that in the midst of, of warped and crooked generations. Um, how have you seen God working in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes over the years? And how has your interaction, you've been really involved in the church, how has your interaction with the church and the fellowship of believers impacted that as well? Mm, okay. Encourage that. So th this is a very difficult <laughs> question because God has changed me mm. in so many ways, and I'm still young and I'm maturing. And there's a lot I need to work on. You're perfectly <laughs> obedient, Miles. What are you talking about? Uh, um, the, the way uh, God has been working my life most fundamentally is, is he's been growing my, my heart for other people. Mm. Um, he's been growing. Uh, naturally, I'm a pretty shy person. Uh, he's given me uh, bravery to want to grow and connect with other people. And this has helped me here at church where, um, I mean, today we talk about valuing others above yourselves. Mm. Um, this has helped me with serving, um, and this has helped me with uh, not grumbling and <laughs> complaining. Um, and, and working here in the church has helped my attitude outside of church, right? Mm -hmm. Because here, you know, Dave was talking about how believers are held accountable when they're confronted with other believers, but outside of church, you have to remember that you're, you're um, an advertisement for Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That, you know, if you're complaining in the workplace or if you have a pretty pessimistic attitude that um, people aren't, <laughs> that's, that's just a really bad image for Christianity and, and, and an illustration of Christ. So uh, serving here in the church has helped me with that. And, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. It's just a difficult <laughs> yeah. question. Oh. So That's good, yeah. The, I love that. So the Fellowship of Believers has helped um, – to, to use language from elsewhere, right, has, has helped encourage you and spur you on to love and good deeds, which you then carry out. And you're absolutely right. If you go out with these grumbling, pessimistic attitudes, um, you're not shining the light of Christ, right? You're shining the darkness of the world. Um, and so I'm super thankful for the amount of time, the time that you've been involved in the church. I'm thankful that you've gotten bold. Um, because he's gotten bold, that means that he wants absolutely everybody to come up and say thank you <laughs> after service for sharing today. Um, and uh, you've been a blessing um, to me, to the youth ministry, to those who came before me, um, to your parents. Um, and I'm really thankful for the, the continued work of Christ in you. Um, I'd like to pray for you really fast before we conclude our, our message. Can I, can I do that? I am guess. I, am I allowed? <laughs> okay. All right. Let me, let me pray for you really fast. Uh, Father, you are a God who sees us. And I thank you that you saw Miles. Before Miles even could speak before miles could walk lord you saw him you formed him in his mother's womb and at the same time lord you formed him in the hearts of jody and chris and lord i thank you for your saving work your physical saving work your spiritual saving work and the work that you continue to do to um draw him to you that he might will and act according to your good purposes i pray that miles would continue to work out his own salvation with fear and trembling, trusting not in the wisdom of man, but trusting in the wisdom that comes from the word of life. And thank you for his boldness to share today. Thank you for his boldness to grow in fellowship with those who are not like him. And may he continue to strive ever onward to the glory of God in the highest. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Miles. Thank you, Cross Point. been a morning. <laughs> I'm grateful for our sound people. Thank you for working hard to make things work out for us. It's a hard job. <laughs> I am grateful for that. God's word is living and active. 
and it works in us. So hopefully, as we're going we're gonna to sing a song, we're going to do a, um, a benediction. I'm going to do a quick prayer as well. Hopefully from this morning, you will remember a number of things. Number one, that we are to walk like Christ did. Right? That we are to obey the Father, hold on to the word, know that God gives us the will and the power to work in us, and we are to live out our salvation, work out our salvation, an understanding that ultimately will give an account to God. Practically, man, the weeks to come, God help us to be people who are not complainers and grumblers against God, against other believers. God help us to do that as we look forward to the great reward that God has promised you and I. So, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for this congregation. <laughs> A lot of stuff happening today. But, God, I ask, Father, that your word would penetrate our hearts. Thank you for a young man by the grace of God is here, has given himself over to the word and living that out as we are doing so in community. Thank you for parents who had said yes to be obedient. Thank you for grandparents and a congregation that has and continues to say yes. God, I ask, Father, that you would help us to hold firmly to your word, that it wouldn't be a word, but the word. Help us to live this out, and I know you do, because you delight in doing it, so we ask for your help as we follow you in obedience. Thank you for the promise that we have, that Roger is experiencing even now as he's in your presence. We know that to live is Christ and to die is gain, and what is coming is far better. But now we walk and we're grateful for the joy you give us and the grace you give us and the joy you will give us and the grace you will give us. We're grateful for that. So may you be honored in our hearts, God, in this congregation. Lord, help us to live these things out because of your working inside of us. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.